First of all, tell us about the rise of supply-side economics and the, in effect, the intellectual conflict that that <coughs> set up within the Republican Party and even conservatives. Hold for a second, would you? One second. Yep. Excuse me. Yeah, let's see how it goes. Okay. I mean, let's you know, right. somewhere between a soundbite and loquacious. Yeah. Uh, but no, I mean I realize it's a, it's a big subject and it's a it's a you know but you know basically <coughs> to explain to a to a yeah. general audience. Um, I, I never really liked the phrase supply side because it um, was too esoteric for people. I was much more populist. Uh, I would have called it incentive-oriented economics as opposed to supply-side. Supply-side was coined by Herb Stein uh, in the Nixon White House on the Council of Economic Advisors to imply or, or to convey the idea that the economy is driven by the production side of the economy, the worker, the saver, the investor, the entrepreneur. So to that extent, it is defensible, but I would have liked an easier uh, way to convey the idea that we're going to create incentives in the economy for work and investment by lowering the tax rates across the board and increasing the reward, the incentive, for taking your hard-earned time and your hard-earned capital that you've saved up and put it at risk in the economy. So uh, it became radicalized a little bit by Art Laffer, my friend uh, who d designed the curve. Oh, I just, I'm sorry. That's okay. We interrupt this. Let <laughs> <coughs> me just get a piece of tape so that you can move around. I don't use radicalized as a pejorative, by the way. I'm using right. it sure, uh, sure. to convey the idea that radical in Latin means to go back to the roots. And I think No, absolutely. I mean, I would, for example, I would contrast, <laughs> I would say, Ronald Reagan was a radical conservative, and George Bush 41 was a conservative. Yeah. You know, in the yeah. classic Fair sense enough. that, uh, you know. <coughs> I'll try to behave myself here. <laughs> no, you're fine now. I got tape on you. Okay, we're good. Sure, we'll just pick up. I'll go back off. to the. Uh, it was radicalized by uh, my friend Art Laffer. I don't mean that as a pejorative, I just mean it to explain that he uh, wanted to uh, convey uh, a more radical. Uh, private enterprise approach to growth or getting America moving again by designing a curve that showed there are two levels of taxation at which no revenue is raised. 100% taxation, no revenue, no one would produce, uh, or zero. And then in between, uh, there's a curve around which people uh, would be incentivized to help grow the economy by working and saving and investing. So. Art, uh, bless his heart, uh, he used to answer every question on fiscal policy by saying growth cures everything. A growing economy is the maximum uh, effort of the government to create the conditions uh, for uh, a bigger pie, uh, more employment, more growth, uh, and revenue comes from growth, not from just uh, uh, cutting spending. So. The, the most controversial part of it is when uh, I had read uh, the, the speech by John F. Kennedy at the New York Economic Club in 61 uh, or 62 when Kennedy said it's a paradoxical truth that high rates of taxation cause low revenues and the best way to get more revenue is to bring down the rates and people forget the top rate in 60 when he ran against Nixon was 90 and Nixon did nothing about that. In fact, the conservative position was you can't cut tax rates until you balance the budget. Now, and, and that brings us to this, shall we say, traditional Republican view. Um, how did, how did <coughs> the new economics come into conflict, um, say, late 70s, early yeah. 80s, with yeah. the rise of Ronald Reagan? Well, the economy was on its backside in the, in the 70, uh, mid-70s. Uh, and I had introduced this bill that paralleled the tax rate cut of Kennedy of 62, 63. It was passed under Johnson, but it was Kennedy's idea of a 30% across the board rate reduction. And so I had my staff design a Kennedy tax rate reduction for my office, for me. Uh, and it was actually 30% in one year. And then Bill Roth came aboard, and the Kemp Roth bill was uh, a three year. 10% rate reduction a year for three years, excuse me. So it conflicted with traditional orthodox fiscalism 
because it was to reduce the rates to grow the economy in the face of a deficit which was very heterodoxical, uh, to say the least. And um, I would, parenthetically speaking, uh, Goldwater, uh, Howard Baker, the Republican Party of, uh, in 62 voted unanimously against lowering the tax rates across the board, a la John F. Kennedy. But Kennedy was very popular in Buffalo, where I was the congressman where I was in Congress uh, from the district uh, in upstate New York. And so I had no problem quoting Kennedy all the time. I drove, I drove, I drove everybody crazy with my Kennedy quotes. And uh, in fact, I remember Teddy Kennedy saying one time, uh, I wish my brother were alive to answer this young backbencher in the Republican Party, Jack Kemp. And Ronald Reagan comes into the picture at what point? <clears throat> uh, in terms of embracing this. Yeah, uh, uh, in 78, 79, uh, being from a heavily AFL CIO district like Buffalo, I made a lot of points with my working class district by talking uh, about how the Kemp Roth bill, the Kemp Roth 30% rate reduction bill, would increase the after tax earnings for not only the investor, but for the worker. And in, in New York in the late 70s, as inflation pushed working families into high tax rates, our, our uh, 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 Chrysler, Ford, GM, Longshoremen, electrical worker unions were in the 40, 50 percent tax bracket, counting the federal and the uh, state tax. The tax rates in New York were 14 under Nelson Rockefeller. So I never talked about, uh, uh, I talked about growth first and then increasing the after tax rate of return for workers labor. And I gave a speech in Bell Harbor, Florida to the AFL-CIO uh, Longshoremen's Union Convention, all black, all Puerto Rican, all people of color. And I gave this speech about how the Camp Roth bill would increase the rate of return on working on the docks, working in the Ford stamping plant in Lackawanna, New York. And I got this standing ovation. It was picked up in the Miami papers. Uh, Reagan read about it, or somebody gave it to Reagan. And he called me and said he would support the Camp Roth tax rate cut for the 1980 campaign. And everybody else was calling it voodoo economics, you know, yep. uh, witch doctors, um, snake oil salesmen. That was just coming from Republicans. <laughs> you can't believe what the Democrats were saying about it. So Ronald Reagan really in 80, 79, 80, was the only national Republican figure to support uh, this uh, radical lower tax rate in the face of inflation and unemployment. And the Keynesian economic model of manipulating inflation <clears throat> by allowing unemployment to go up and bringing down unemployment by letting inflation go up it, it, it had reached the, its ultimate conundrum. They couldn't solve the problem of simultaneous inflation and unemployment. So the Reaganomics side of this Campanomics, uh, excuse me, uh, that's, that's <laughs> oh, no, an overreach. Um, the, the, the supply side uh, answer was tight money to solve inflation, which Volcker, you know, Volcker uh, 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 pursued, and lower tax and regulatory barriers to produce, uh, to goose, uh, to grow the economy. Sure. Uh, was a simultaneous action on both the inflation and unemployment uh, level, and it, it ended up working, and not till 83, though. Not till 83. Now, so you have an election <clears> night, <throat> 80, when Ronald Reagan's winning this triumphant victory, and to the astonishment of many, the Republicans are taking the Senate, making major gains in the House, yeah. but taking the Senate, which means all of a sudden an orthodox Republican like Bob Dole is going to be chairing the Finance Committee. And Howard Baker is going to be majority leader, and um, some of those some of those very folks who uh, who were at least suspicious of this new uh, new, More new than unorthodoxy. Suspicious. Okay, More than and, suspicious. And, and, yeah, how did that play itself out in the? And yeah, I mean Dole turned out to be a good soldier in terms oh, of absolutely. You know, carrying yeah. the Bob had a lot of fun at uh, sometimes at my expense um, talking about this. Uh, Supply side school of economics. And Howard Baker called me a witch doctor and a snake oil salesman, and he's one of my best or dear friends. So it, it really was controversial. 
All the younger Republicans in the House, particularly Trent Lott, Vin Weber, Dan Lundgren, Henry Hyde, uh, myself, uh, we had a group of uh, young backbenchers who were pursuing these ideas, um, and it caused some friction. But Reagan was kind of our uh, spokesman, and um, uh, Howard Baker and Bob and uh, George Bush, uh, now Vice President, had called it Voodoo Economics, and I served in his cabinet, so um, he, he uh, I, think, I think clearly the efficacy of the policies of fiscal, I'd say, uh, uh, some would say looseness and monetary tightness worked. Uh, and I don't know if everybody came around, but I, I know Bob Dole uh, did, and because he was intellectually honest, he was intellectually honest. He came from the Eisenhower wing of the party. Oh, okay. Eisenhower, the biggest fight Eisenhower had with the Congress was over Bob Taft from Ohio trying to cut tax rates in nineteen forty in nineteen fifty two. Oh. Big big battle between uh, Eisenhower and Taft, and Bob came from the Eisenhower wing of the party, which is a great, you know, more orthodox wing of of. Uh, of, of the party of Lincoln, and um, Reagan loved Calvin Coolidge. Who would bring up Calvin Coolidge other than Ronald Reagan? Because Coolidge in the 20s had cut the top rate, the wartime rate, from 70 down to 28, and the roaring 20s uh, ensued. Hoover reversed all that. So um, I remember one time I was campaigning in Iowa, and um, they said, what's the difference between you, Mr. Camp, and all these other Republicans? I said, well, I come from the I come from the Lincoln wing of the party, the Lincoln Coolidge growth wing of the party, and everybody else comes from the Herbert Hoover wing of the party. And someone said, do you know where you are? And uh, I said, yeah, West Branch, Iowa. Well, do you know who's from West Branch, Iowa? <laughs> Herbert Hoover. The main street of West Branch, Iowa is Herbert Hoover Boulevard. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with that. One thing I would think you and Dole would have in common, though, first of all, there's a, Dole's, I mean, Dole's a complex guy, and I always thought that there's a bit of a populist yeah. And Dole. I mean, growing up dirt poor yeah. in Depression era Kansas, yeah. I think was at least as much of an imprint on him as the war. And and um, well said. Yeah, you he know, definitely was a populist, yeah. a prairie populist. Uh, he knew that's what, in my opinion why he was so much for free trade. He knew that we needed markets for our agricultural exports, and he was not just uh, a populist in the sense he was going to hurt the manufacturing sector, as happened under, uh, you know, that's, uh, that was a traditional battle between the manufacturing Northeast and the agricultural Midwest uh, right through the Lincoln years uh, and uh, up until Hoover. So uh, Bob, uh, being a internationalist, saw that a strong foreign policy, a strong military, a strong trade policy were essential ingredients of a prosperous, Small D Democratic America. And another area where I think you have an awful lot in common, uh, it's well known, beginning in your football days, I mean, that you were an outspoken champion of, of broadening the Republican Party, making it much more uh, inviting, particularly to African Americans yeah. and other minority groups. And I, I know that was a fight that, that Dole was yeah. interested in as well. Like, uh, Bob like was a classical. Your head against the wall? Or? Yeah, Bob Dole was a, a classical liberal an 18th century liberal on democracy and uh, making the Republican Party inclusive. Uh, he, uh, he had a wonderful congressional record and senatorial record, uh, and he made so many friends across the aisle. I, uh, George McGovern, and, and they're, they're uh, joining together uh, in Food uh, for Peace program. Uh, so Bob, Bob really understood, I think, the Lincoln side of our party as opposed to some, unfortunately, who kind of come from the know-nothing wing of the party. Um, uh, I know nothing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, it, yeah. it, there, there are strains in both parties. Uh, both political parties had that split. The, the Republican Party had a great history, in my opinion, of civil rights and human rights and voting rights and kind of walked away from it other than Bob Dole. Uh, the Democratic Party had a horrible history of racism, but overcame it thanks to Lyndon Baines Johnson. And um, so I give the Democratic Party credit for that. 
but Bob and I, and among a lot of others, now we don't take credit for it, wanted to make the party much more Lincolnian, much more inclusive, much more diverse, and it's a tough battle because we still have those strains in both political parties. Let me ask you, about, in addition to the philosophical <laughs> disagreements that you had in the early 80s, um, how much of this was the House versus the Senate? Is there, is there in fact, that, that tension between the two bodies? I think there might have been. Uh, we were, you know, really backbenchers. The leadership of the House Republicans kind of went along with us. Uh, and, of course, Reagan shoved it to its um, maturation point in, in 82 and 83. Uh, there, was, there was tension between the House and the Senate. Uh, Bill Roth would call it the Roth-Kemp bill, and most people <laughs> call it the Kemp-Roth bill. A funny story, I was at the Roth the memorial service, and uh, it was packed in, De in uh, Delaware, and, and uh, uh, all the speeches were about the Roth-Kemp bill, and all of a sudden Dick Cheney had sent a letter to be read, and he said, by the way, to the Roth family, thank you for the great service of Bill Roth, and, and uh, his great contribution to America because of the Kemp Roth bill. And everybody in the audience turned and looked at me. I felt very uh, uh, pleased, but a little bit embarrassed. Uh, but there, there was tension, but it wasn't animosity. It sounds like though, there was also an element of generational divide here. Yeah. That, you know, there was talk about the College of Cardinals, the, you know, the old bulls, in effect, uh, in the Senate. And, and you were of a different, uh, different generation, different outlook? Yeah, you know, well, I had, had played professional football for 13 years, and I was used to, you know, battling on Sunday and then being friends on Monday uh, or after the game. And uh, to me, uh, I love to compete in the arena of ideas and still be friends post uh, policy differences. Some people took those policy differences very uh, seriously, and uh, some people didn't. The good thing about Bob is uh, you could you could debate him, and uh, he he'd give you a, a good uh, you know right uh, uh, a slam at the at the at the right side of the jaw. But uh, he was he was always with it was always with humor and friendship, and uh, I respected that because I think he had been through the valley of the shadow himself, and uh, his life being saved. Uh, he had a very compassionate attitude towards the people with whom he disagreed. How else can you explain McGovern and Dole being such good friends? I mean, I used to rail against George McGovern. Today I can't do that anymore because I have such enormous respect for George McGovern and the, the genuine, I'm going to say love mm. uh, and respect between Bob and George McGovern. It's a beautiful friendship. And I, I, uh, I sat down after the, the Dole announcement uh, in, uh, in Lawrence when we had that big dinner, and my wife and I were having a, a late night uh, snack, and uh, George McGovern came in, and we sat down with him and talked for about an hour and a half, and I just came to see yeah. that Bob had more influence on him than he had on Bob. That's fascinating. Um, you ran yeah. against each other in 88, yeah. and there's that extraordinary week between the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primary, where, um, you know, <coughs> Dick Worthwood is telling Dole, I think by Friday of that week, you know, yeah. you're, 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 you've got this made. And I don't think Dole ever, ever really believed him. Um, and then, of course, what was it? The, uh, the ad, I mean, the Sununu organization went to work with the Senator Stratowad. And, and then there was the, the debate the, uh, and the non signing of the tax pledge. I mean, can you describe? You that know that uh, Bob did not sign it. Is that am, am yeah, I, right? Yeah, yeah, it was a televised debate. Yeah. I think Sunday before the New Hampshire primary. I think Pete Dupont, the former governor of Delaware, was tougher on Bob than was I. Yeah. Uh, I had the idea that you could run a campaign, and I was very naive about this, strictly on ideas, and uh, I wasn't much of an infighter, uh, and. So DuPont really challenged uh, Bob Dole, uh, and uh, I think I finished uh, third. But uh, it was it was um, it was really DuPont who uh, nailed Bob uh, for not signing that pledge. To me, the pledge was a priori self-evident truth: uh, just sign it and get it over with. Yeah. And Bob wouldn't. Yeah. Then, um, how do you come to be on the ticket in 96? 
<laughs> after the campaign was over, Bob said uh, publicly and with me in the audience that he wished he'd pick Tiger Woods. Remember, Tiger just won his first Masters, and I always thought, wow, only Bob Dole could say that. Uh, I've, I've teased him about it, and he teases me about it. Um, well, Bob had people around him who were fans and friends of mine, uh, Scott Reed and Charlie Black and uh, John Buckley, who had worked with me in the past. Um, and I guess they got so hard up. No, no. Um, I had done, uh, you know, my work at HUD had given me a little different profile than most Republicans. Uh, I had never sacrificed any of my heartfelt principles uh, from the supply side days, but I tried to uh, do it in the inner city where people were left out, left behind in public housing and enterprise zones and uh, ownership and, and things that I thought could help convert our lower uh, income uh, people to, to, if not upper, at least middle income. And um, got some credit for it, got some publicity for it. And uh, here's a guy who can talk to black audiences and brown audiences and mixed audiences. And I think Bob uh, came to the conclusion with the help of uh, advisors that uh, maybe Kemp would make a good candidate. Uh, and we sat down. Uh, I, w I was reluctant uh, because I had enormous respect for Bob. I knew it was going to be a tough race against uh, Clinton and Gore because they had a good economy and a relatively peaceful world. And that's a recipe for re-election. Uh, re it did that for Reagan. Uh, didn't do it for Bush uh, 41. And uh, I thought it might very well do it for Clinton Gore. And uh, we talked several times. Uh, and I had Do you have any asked, idea sort of how early, um, yeah, well, how far out from it the was, convention? Uh, to, gosh, it was, was late it? June, early July, right before the Real, convention. Right before the convention. Yeah. And I went to his apartment uh, and talked with uh, Elizabeth and Bob. And as I said, I was very reluctant, not because of disrespect to Bob, but just the, f the concern that it was going to be a very tough campaign. And I thought he needed more of a pit bull. And I, I'm not mm. the pit bull politician that uh, Gingrich is or, you know, um, or some of our, our other friends. And um, so I thought Bob needed somebody different than a Jack Kemp. You know, I was kind of the happy warrior, uh, you know, always uh, kind of smiling and seeing the sunny side of the street and the glass half, half full and reluctant to go. And Bob said, you know what, Jack, we're not going to we're not going to run that kind of a race. Uh, Bill Clinton's our adversary, he's not the enemy. He's an adversary. And I like that. I like that formulation. And uh, Bob is, it was, is a gentleman, uh, notwithstanding how tough a life he had been through uh, and experiences, but he was a gentleman's gentleman, and he was highly regarded on the le center left and the center right. So once I was assured that that was the way the campaign was going to be run, uh, and I wasn't going to have to rip off the, the, the face of, of Al Gore and, and, uh, and Bill Clinton, uh, I decided to, my wife and I talked about it and decided to do it and loved every second of it. Elizabeth and Bob Dole treated Joanne and Jack Kemp in such a wonderful fashion that uh, it was a joy, even to lose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do you know other names? What other names were being tossed about as uh, prospective candidates? Uh, yeah, now you're going to have to remind me of that. Okay. Well, gosh, I mean, I remember from John Engler to um, um, Connie Mack. I yeah. think was mentioned, and uh, um, oh, I think uh, I think Jim Edgar was. Was mentioned. I mean, you know, the the great mentioner. But I mean, yeah, yeah. There was a sense of real surprise when your name yeah. was unveiled, yeah. and how much of that was in fact part of the equation. That Dole, you know, remember Dole needing to sort of restart the campaign. Yeah, had quit the Senate. You know, pretty dramatic. Yeah, and and they hadn't really. That hadn't really turned things around, and and how much do you think they were at, they were trying to surprise? Let people know. Look, you, you think you know me, but you don't know me. I can I can surprise you, and and picking you well, in it, many ways was yeah. It was a surprise because I was not orthodox. I was uh, you know outside the box uh, in my congressional days and in my days at HUD, and uh, everybody knew that Dole and Kemp had had this kind of. Uh, 
not adversarial, but a clash of, of ideas. And how could how could Kemp accept or how could Dole pick Kemp? And the campaign, the campaign, the convention in San Diego. I played for the Chargers. I was the first quarterback of the Chargers in San Diego, and uh, so there was a, uh, and it was kept secret for almost until the last eleventh hour. And um, when it was announced, it it, it was uh, quite thrilling for all of us, and Bob uh, included. Uh, do, you, do you remember where, where where the actual invitation was 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 made? I mean, how he yeah, the Watergate Hotel. His apartment at the Watergate, and uh, uh, Scott Reed was there. John Buckley was there, and uh, Bob and Elizabeth, and uh, I. I visited them two or three times and uh, expressed heartfelt reluctance. And as I said earlier, once I knew how the campaign was going to be waged, and uh, respectful of both of us, and he wanted to lower the tax rate fifteen percent and made fun of the fact that I was old number 15, and Joanne Elizabeth's uh, the letters, uh, it was really clever. Bob's got an unbelievable mind that very very few people can comprehend how quickly he comes to these uh, jokes and, and uh, quips. Uh, he said one time that uh, Joanne Elizabeth, uh, there's 15 letters in their names, and you know, I was old number 15, and my son was old number 15, and we're going to cut tax rates 15. And er the whole campaign, he would come up with different ways of, dis of, uh, of calculating uh, number 15. It was, a, it was a joy. It was an absolute joy and a blessing. I didn't have to go out and raise money. I hated raising money. All the money had been raised. Bob had these friends all over the country who had, you know, done a great job of putting him uh, in a financial shape that uh, I didn't have to do. I went to a couple of fundraisers, but I yeah. didn't have to do heavy lifting. So it was a it was a real. I remember fun you? Experience. There was the there was the trip to Russell. Yep. Talk about that because that must have been for you mean him. No for him, the, the very very yeah. emotional. Uh, oh, it was to, very to shell the place off to you. The night before, we were in a little motel. I can't even remember the town. It was outside Russell. They wanted to keep it a secret, and my wife and I are flown in from in secret and landed at an airport and uh, we sneak into this motel and um, uh, all of a sudden about 11 o'clock at night it starts to storm and anybody who's lived through a Kansas uh, rainstorm knows what I'm talking about. I mean it was not just raining, it was just pouring and gushes and lightning and thunder and we can't sleep. And uh, my wife says, do you think this is an omen? <laughs> We got very nervous that night. Woke up the next day, went over and had coffee with Elizabeth and Bob and, and uh, had a great announcement and um, found ourselves on the cover of Time Magazine and Newsweek and uh, went to San Diego and Bob got a hero's welcome and uh, I'd throw footballs around, you know, it was, it was uh, and he, fun. And he took, he took you through the old family home <gasps> oh, in boy. Russell. Yeah, talked about his family and his roots and uh, see my, my daddy was a truck driver. And we had a very modest uh, home in Los Angeles, California, and uh, he drove a truck. He never went to college. My mother was a well-educated uh, University of California at Berkeley and, and uh, Montana, University of Montana at Missoula. So she was highly educated, Phi Beta Kappa. My dad was just a truck driver and a good athlete. And uh, so my, my roots were not unlike Bob's. Hard, hard work. Never saw my father six days a week he worked. You know, I see him on Sunday at church, and, and uh, or maybe uh, a little bit on Saturday. And Bob's life in, in Russell, to go through that house and to see what it was like for the Dole family, uh, just bonded us, uh, at least me to him. Uh, yeah, that was very emotional, very emotional. And Elizabeth, throughout that time, I, I, I think she's one of the most wonderful women I had ever met because she just had so much empathy uh, and a strong faith and um, it helped Joanne and me to weather some of the you know bricks and uh, stones and have you ever heard him talk about his his wartime experiences I mean, and after the war is you know uh, no not in the sense that he he didn't like to talk about that but I'll tell you what when he would see anybody in the audience from the 10th Mountain Division, he would have to stop his speech. He could be talking about cutting tax rates or cutting the growth of spending or talk about trade, and he would pause and invite this old warrior up on the stage. And then he would talk about how few were alive today 
and how many were dying off, and that great generation uh, that Brokaw taught book had, uh, had made him very emotional, mm. uh, and as well it should be. Like me talking about, you know, my football. I'd call <laughs> my football player friends. We went to Buffalo when I got the after the nomination, San Diego. We did a couple stops in between. Went to Springfield and did the Lincoln uh, uh, recollections uh, and look at the at the memorial to Abraham Lincoln in Springfield. Then went to Buffalo and had all my old teammates back, mm. and uh, we had a great event. Bob loved it. Uh, he loved it. He loved football. He played football. He he played uh, uh, football himself, and and I think that was a. Uh, I'd always said had uh, Richard Nixon been first string at Whittier instead of third string at Whittier, he never would have had the. Uh, <laughs> the yeah. But Bob had it was first string, and it, it served him well. Tell me, how did the the, the fifteen percent tax cut, which was yeah. the centerpiece in many ways of the campaign, yeah. certainly taken off? How did that come about? You know, I don't know. By the time I did a tax reform task force. For Speaker Gingrich and and Leader Dole, in uh, right before the '96 campaign, and we had a, we had some really good people on there, uh, and we we came out with a plan to reform the tax code and have a single tax. All people should pay tax. Don't nobody escapes taxation, but it should be one tax, not five. You know, you earn income, you pay a tax. You save it, you pay a tax. You invest it, you pay a tax. Capital gains is unindexed. That's a fifth tax. And if you die, which is a distinct possibility, you know, you're going to pay again. So we came out with this plan. Bob really liked it. I think out of that overall our overarching uh, reform agenda, Bob uh, adopted a 15% reduction in the rates, which had been lowered by Reagan uh, and uh, raised by uh, Clinton. Uh, and, and frankly, raised by um, <clears throat> the Bush administration. In fact, I think that was, uh, in retrospect, not to pick on George H.W. Bush, but I think that tax uh, rate increase of uh, 92, 92, 93, uh, sunk his hopes. Yeah. I, I, was, I, was, I, I feel bad about this because uh, we went around the room in the Bush administration and all the cabinet members supported it. And I said, Mr. President, uh, I, I, I love you dearly and I'm honored to be in your cabinet. Please don't raise the taxes. Don't buy into this George Mitchell $3 of spending cuts for every $1 of static uh, income tax increase. And, um, you know, he made that pledge, read my lips, no new taxes. And Bob... Bob was great, though. Uh, he 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 loved talking about that 15% rate reduction. It wasn't a 15% tax cut. Tax cut implies a revenue loss. Oh. With a lower rate, you'd have a bigger economy and more revenue. And I used to drive people crazy with that because they'd say, well, Jack Kemp's idea of stopping an intercontinental ballistic missile is to cut taxes. I said, yeah, that's the first thing I'd do. The second thing I'd do is rebuild a, you know, our uh, missile defense system. So Dole had become, in effect, uh, yeah. a convert, yeah. if you will, yeah. we to, all to the all basic concept. Absolutely, sort of absolutely. And I, I, I respected him enormously for that because he had to go back on what he thought. But I had changed my mind. Uh, I had changed my mind about things. I don't mind people changing their mind if they get on the right side of something. Uh, and I think Bob had the intellectual honesty and political integrity uh, to not only adopt it, but adapt it to his rhetoric and to his uh, mindset, and uh, we were serious about it. Um, when you, when you, and early on, I mean, you had these discussions and uh, about campaign strategy, <clears throat> and looking back, it's sort of hard to imagine how that campaign could have been won. But, but obviously, at some at some point, they thought it could have been won. What was the what was the notion? How how are you gonna how are you gonna how are you gonna beat Bill Clinton? Well, I, you know, I wasn't in on a lot of the strategy. Uh, I was uh, picked as vice presidential uh, candidate uh, very late in the process. Uh, the strategy went on in the Dole camp, as opposed to I was out on the road with my wife and my team, and we both had good teams. Um, yeah, it's hard to think of how it could have been won. Because, again, in, in a relatively peaceful 
environment in foreign policy, and with a pretty good economy, which it was. And you know, Clinton had signed a lower capital gain tax, he had signed welfare reform, he had signed NAFTA, which lowered tariffs uh, in North American uh, free trade agreement. Those were three tax cuts. Remember, hadn't he said the era of big government is over? Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, one other thing, uh, nobody's really investigated this, but it would be interesting to observe what TV was like post, my nom post San Diego Convention. If you remember, uh, the Clinton administration started bombing North Iraq, Northern Iraq, and Southern Iraq, ostensibly to help the Kurds in the North and the Shiites in the South. And they bombed for about 15 days. And all the Republicans in the Senate, including my buddy Trent Lott, and I don't say this to be mean about it, but they all were supporting this bombing program. The front pages were filled for almost two and a half weeks after our convention, after Labor Day, when campaigns could really start. The papers and the television every night was uh, our bombing of Iraq and weakening the regime of Saddam Hussein and protecting the Kurds. And I mean, it was, it was Reagan foreign policy at work yeah. or Dole foreign policy. Yeah. And um, by the time the middle of September rolled around, we were 16, 17 points down. And uh, uh, again, I'm not an expert and I can't remember every view, every, uh, every uh, uh, headline or every newscast, but uh, by the time we got into October, uh, Bob uh, was campaigning day and night, and I think Bob Dole himself saved the Republican House and Senate. Had it not been for Bob and his indefatigable tenacity saved for the Republican Party the House and the Senate. I think to this day, uh, had it not been for Bob, we'd have lost not only the presidency, but the House and the Senate. And, and, and what makes you say that? Because <clears throat> the, the, the polling data was so negative. Um, and, and Clinton was popular. You know, I think he could have beaten Ronald Reagan in 96. And he had that charming demeanor. Uh, everybody knew everything you could know about uh, uh, Bill Clinton. There was, they, they, some people got mad at me for the, for the, uh, in the debate with Al Gore that I didn't rip off the Clinton facade. There was, everybody knew that it was a facade. Uh, it was re redundant to be talking personally about Bill Clinton. And he was something? easy to like. And he had a good economy, and he had relatively strong foreign policy credentials. And um, anyway, I, I and 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 let's face it. I mean, <clears throat> Republicans had taken over Congress in '94, but paid a certain price. I mean, the whole government shut down, for example. <sighs> Terrible mistake by Newt Gingrich. Clinton sucked Gingrich into a terrible political cul-de-sac. And uh, he was very clever. And then Newt whined about it. And not being on Air Force One, allowed to come off the front of the plane. And the papers were full of cartoons making fun of, of uh, the Gingrich house. And it must have driven Dole up the wall. Well, it did. Just stylistically. I mean, yeah, it because just, he, 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 he would never do that. Yeah. Bob Dole would, uh, knew that there were, were limits to how you negotiate over the budgets. I remember Newt saying one day, um, he would keep the government shut down even, it meant, even if it meant defaulting on the credit worthiness of the United States of America. I remember calling Newt and saying, Newt, do you realize Alexander Hamilton is turning over in his grave because he established the credit worthiness of the United States at the Constitutional Convention in 1787 to 1789. He paid off 100 cents on the dollar of all our Revolutionary War debt. He put the country on the gold standard. He established the common market of our, the United States because it hadn't been functioning. And I told this story to Newt. I said, Newt, the American people w love revolutions now and then. But they, they elected George Washington as our president, not Patrick Henry. You cannot be Patrick Henry in perpetuity. We got to govern. Get this budget deal signed. Uh, look, I'm smiling as I say this because Newt himself knows he made a, uh, 
an era. But the Republican Party in the House was not held in, in high regard in 96. And we, Bob saved it. <laughs> Bob saved it, bless his heart. And remember in the last <clears throat> couple of weeks, you also got a little bit of help because there were the questions being raised about quitting fundraising yeah. and abuse of the White House, the Lincoln bedroom, and so forth and so on. Yeah. So that began to filter into the political discourse uh, yeah. a bit. Yeah, to a certain extent. But people, people knew there were personal failings by, by President Clinton. But Something happened in the Clinton presidency that I think is a real turning point. For the first time in history, pollsters asked two questions about presidential performance. For the first time ever, they, they asked voters, what do you think about the president's performance in office? And then, then secondarily, what do you think about the president personally? And it almost gave license to the electorate to hold these two seemingly conflicting views. And in effect, institutionalize the notion that the president's character, personal behavior, whatever, is a secondary, secondary part. As long as the stock market was going up, as long as people felt good, they, they would tolerate a lot. Well, uh, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier in answer to an earlier question. People knew just about everything you could possibly know about Bill and Hillary Clinton. And I don't say that to be mean about it. It was just a fact of life. Uh, in, in politics, uh, from Kennedy on, uh, people were aware of just about everything in their candidates. So, And Bob made it very clear that he would never attack anybody personally. He would attack their positions and their policies, and there was a reason to do that. But again, uh, given uh, the foreign policy of the Clinton administration, given uh, his statement that the era of big government is over, it signed welfare reform, NAFTA, signed a capital gain tax cut. Um, gosh. Uh, it's hard to get traction. The market was going up, uh, and no one was going to, uh, you had the Republicans, Republican, and Democrats, Democrat, and then the fight for the middle was where we tried to get, and uh, he captured it. Of course, Perot did run again, but Perot presumably was he much was less a non of a factor. factor. Uh, yeah. yeah, a yeah. non-sequitur. Yeah. How did you prepare for your debate with Al Gore? Judd Gregg was Al Gore, and we uh, went to Bob's um, condo in, in, uh, in Florida and uh, spent two or three days. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was uh, interesting um, preparing for that debate because uh, I had trouble getting a handle on how to attack them without seeming to be personal. And uh, it, was, it was a fair debate. It wasn't, uh, you know, the, I enjoyed it, but I, I didn't. Uh, Did Dole give you any advice before? No, or no. Yeah. I'd been on Meet the Press the weekend before, and Tim Russert's from Buffalo, and I, he's a tremendous interlocutor. He not only asks a question, it's an interesting question, Plus, he gives you time to answer it, which is unlike so many talk shows. And he had asked me the question about the 15% tax cut, how would we pay for it? And I had said, well, uh, the revenues uh, would come in like Niagara Falls. And uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Gore people had seen an opening. And during the debate, I defended it by using that phrase again, and Gore picked up on it and said that it would be a Niagara Falls of debt and deficits and disaster and something like that. And everybody laughed, gave him a, oh, I just, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I gave you some more. <clears throat> the, um, the, the, during the campaign, I mean, would, how frequently would you talk with Dole? Would, uh, would uh, we campaigned together quite often. Um, and then we campaigned. I campaigned a lot in California at the end. I don't know why, but uh, they wanted me to be in California, thinking that maybe California could come into play. Uh, so we would talk um, once a day, once every other day, and then campaign together a couple days a week. I like to be with him because I think I would energize that side of Bob that, that I thought 
was um, the, the dull humor, the dull optimism, the dull courage, uh, the dull, dull as a vision for the future. Because politics is not about the past, it's about the future. Well, that raises a good question because I got sort of sucked in at the very end of the on the acceptance speech. And remember, Mark Halpern sort of stormed out of San Diego. And the reason was because, you know, old dull hands were looking or rewriting the ending. And, and I put in the line about, I'm the most optimistic man in America, uh, because that's what Dole, I thought, should be running on. It's yeah. about his optimism grounded in his life story, yeah. but projected onto the future. Yeah. And of course, <clears throat> we had this intense internal debate about the helper in text, which was all about sort of the past and trying to get around the age issue. Remember, yeah. and and so and that's where the whole bridge to the future and, and the Clinton people came in and exploited it. Yeah. And uh, did you have a? Did you see a, a text of the? No. Uh, before it was no. before it was delivered. No. Yeah. Uh. Because -uh. yeah. I'd be with you. Um, again, in my experience and part of my existential being. Everything is about the future. People will forgive you the past. They will not forgive a lack of vision for their future or their children's future. And um, Reagan, you ain't seen nothing yet. We've come a long way, but we got a long way to go. Uh, and, and that was really dull, as you say, grounded in his life experience, projected onto the future. Um, that was uh, dull and his view of... Um, this country, so that's where I was, and, and uh, I'm glad some of that got in the speech. <laughs> Not enough, but a little. It, 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 but it did make the headline of the Times the next day. What did it say? Dole, quote, most, most optimistic man in America. Yeah. Pledges, you know. Yeah, great. But um, the problem was, for three quarters of the speech, he sounded like the most pessimistic man in America. And then at the end, you know, kind of flipped the switch and this Reagan-esque optimism. That old-time religion of our party was uh, grounded in, uh, you know, cut spending, balance the budget. Scrooge. I used to, t I used to show people my view of politics that um, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know that you care. Liberals show that they care by spending your money. Conservatives show that they care by balancing your budget. Which more popular, Santa Claus or Scrooge? Now, what is Santa Claus on the right? Cut tax rates, more income after taxes, uh, more growth, more jobs, more revenue. And yeah, we've got to cut spending, or the growth is spending, but start with first things first. Growth, jobs, uh, after tax income, a better life, a better future, lower tariffs, lower duties, more prosperity. Santa Claus, excuse me. But no, no. We, but we were the party of Scrooge. It we, sounds like, I mean, in the 96 campaign, in effect, those two streams came together. Yep. Yeah. But the empirical evidence at work in that campaign, the objective, historical, empirical evidence at that moment in the campaign was that Clinton was tough on foreign policy, which was Reagan-esque, and uh, had signed NAFTA, capital gain tax cuts, and, and, and signed the welfare reform bill. So he had a perfect position for a center-left pro-business Democrat running against a center-right pro-business Republican. Did you ever think you were going to win? <sighs> I didn't see how we could after that September of Clinton bombing everything. And <laughs> I mean, oh, it was brutal. I kept calling Bob. Bob, why are the Republicans in the Senate praising Bill Clinton? Go back and look at the newspaper. It was full of praise. All our guys were praising the robust foreign policy of Bill Clinton, who was taking the headlines away. We didn't get a headline for about two weeks after, the, after Labor Day. So I, I had trouble thinking how to do it. You hope against hope, uh, and I wanted to win, and I... Uh, and Bob, I mean, could anybody have campaigned any harder and longer hours than Bob Dole? You know, there's a story that um, he went back and he, you know, he read the leaks, you know, and there were people in the campaign who were sort of for self-serving purposes. 
trying to distance themselves, you know, from the candidate the, I'm and shocked. the strategy. I'm you know, shocked. I know, I know. In Washington, there's gambling and in. <laughs> people <laughs> try to make themselves look good at the expense of someone else. Yeah. And apparently, one day, and it only happened once in the campaign, he lost it. He he went into a, a meeting, I guess, and he said, "You don't know how hard it is to be out there." When you're 20, 25 points down in the polls, and to campaign your head off yeah. with a smile on your face yeah. and optimism about the result, yeah. and to come back and read this stuff, yeah. which is a very human reaction. Yeah, yeah, and the press would exploit it. I remember one time I gave a speech in Harlem. My wife and I had gone into Sylvia's Soul Food Restaurant in Harlem. And there's some griping in the campaign. Of, Why is Kemp hunting for ducks where there are no ducks, you know? Long story short, there'll never be any ducks for our party if you don't go places where you're unexpected, uh, not expected to campaign. But uh, the young owner of Sylvia's Soul Food Restaurant, Van, Wo uh, Van Woods, uh, is a friend of mine, a Republican, black Republican, and uh, we had this rally at uh, his restaurant, and uh, Charlie Rangel came. And Charlie was an old friend from my house days, and the press asked him, what are you doing at a camp event? He said, Jack and I are friends. And uh, long story short, uh, we had a nice reception. I get on the plane flying to Boston, and a Boston Globe writer says, could you give the speech you gave at Sylvia Soul Food Restaurant in Harlem to a suburban Kans uh, uh, Kansas City, Kansas uh, audience? I said, of course I could. Kansas City wants the same thing for urban Harlem as anybody else. We had jobs, good education, chance to own your own home. I mean, these things are universal. It's not the American dream. It's the universal dream. So I start bragging a little bit, which was a big mistake because I took the answer to the next level. I said, you know, the Million Man March had just happened. So dumb Jack Kemp said, I could have given that speech at the Million Man March. She said, oh, her antenna go up. And I said, yeah. I said, that was as conservative, small c, Men be good men, be good fathers, be good husbands. Uh, you want the best thing for your family, as everybody does. And I was alluding to that. The headline in the Boston Globe, we woke up the next morning, Kemp praises Farrakhan, or Kemp praises Nation of Islam. Oi, they, I mean, all hell broke loose. So uh, is isn't at all what I had said, uh, but she took it. It really well. Oh. Has has the media has, has that kind of gotcha journalism become more prevalent over the course of your political career? Is that one of the contributing factors to the to the <laughs> ugliness of politics today? I am reluctant to agree with that. Yeah. Other than to say, clearly uh, there are those who can take uh, relatively harmless missteps and. Enlarge them to a point of uh, <laughs> worldwide. Uh, I, I, but I think it's always been true in politics. You know, you've got to be very careful how you uh, word things and what you say. And, and uh, I learned the hard way. I went to a, um, I went with Bibi Netanyahu, the, the uh, finance minister, I think, at the time. Maybe he was a prime minister at the time, to a um, organization of American, to see, presidents of American Jewish organizations. I, I'm stumbling over the exact, but there were about 2,000 uh, leaders in the Jewish community, and I walked in with Bibi, who was an old friend of mine, because the New York Times had picked up the story that Kemp had praised not only the Million Man March, but the Nation of Islam and Louis Farrakhan, and oh my gosh, I <laughs> and I, I was, Bob and I were very pro-Israel, very pro-human rights, both of us cared deeply and profoundly about Soviet Jewry and the cause of reunification of families and the whole issue of civil and human rights, both domestically and, and, uh, and internationally. And um, I almost uh, wiped it out in one <laughs> stupid uh, comment. Do you remember the incident? Of course, you weren't there, but the Chico incident. Remember when Bob Dole fell off the, uh, the stage I, yeah. in Chico? I don't remember Chico, but I remember yeah. the incident. Yeah. It got blown up. Uh, it wasn't exactly Jerry Ford uh, falling off of Air Force One. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I bumbled um, and stumbled. I was at Pepperdine, and I had a lot of family at Pepperdine. My brother was on the board, and we finished out the campaign at Pepperdine in Malibu and a gorgeous scenery. And I'm looking out on the ocean, and I grew up in L.A., so this I was home. 
I had my family with me and uh, some of my old football uh, buddies from the National Football League. And I'm um, on the stage, and my son Jeffrey, who had played in the NFL uh, 11 years, I played 13, he's right behind me. And uh, I said, and next Tuesday, we got to go out and beat Bob Dole. <laughs> and Jeff tugged on my coat. He said, Dad, we're trying to beat Bill Clinton. <laughs> So I said, yeah, beat Bill Clinton, too. <laughs> anyway, the press didn't pick up on it. The guy, I guess they gave us a, 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 a free ride on that. But uh, And then Bob said in San Diego, it's great to be in San Francisco. Do you remember that one? And I said, Bob, we're in San Diego, you know, and he laughed. I don't think there's anybody in politics, including Reagan, who had the ability to turn a faux pas into a little quip and get a laugh than Bob Dole. Where were you on election night? Where was I on election night? I was in uh, Orange County, California uh, with my family, and uh, Bob was in Lawrence. Where was Bob? Uh, I think he was in Washington. Oh. Yeah, I think he was in Washington. When we lost Ohio, I said, that's it. You know, I told my wife, that's it. You can't win the presidency without Ohio and Florida. It was so much fun, though. I mean, I have such great memories, and to think about them again uh, is a joy. Uh, and my respect and love for Bob Dole is uh, unmatched, uh, unparalleled How by anybody other than remembered? Elizabeth. Um, Bob Dole, um, service to America through war, through Congress, the Senate, uh, running for vice president, running for president, service. Uh, Martin Luther King said, not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great in service to mankind. Bob Dole was both famous and great. He's the epitome of what Dr. King was alluding to in that great speech. Yep, and it's interesting because one of the things he's proudest of is his involvement in the King birthday. Yeah. Bill. I was the Republican sponsor in the House with Dan Lundgren, and Bob was in the Senate. And uh, uh, the Reagan White House was not going to sign the bill. They wanted it on Sunday. wouldn't cost money. They were worried about the, the cost. I'm not, not Ronnie Reagan, but the staff. And that's what they're paid to do, look at the cost of things. And they weren't going to sign it. And uh, Bob called in his views. I called in mine. And I, told, I can't remember who I talked to, but I told somebody, do you want the ghost of Abraham Lincoln uh, hovering over your bed like uh, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge and, and uh, that great uh, play by Dickens? Uh, and they signed it, Bush and Dole, not Dole, excuse me, Reagan gave a speech about Martin Luther King that was absolutely beautiful, and Dole and I were there, and I, it was one of the proud moments of his life, it's one of the proud moments of life. Because I, I, I don't think we can have right, racial reconciliation until we understand the black experience, and Bob did. And finally, talk about service. I think one of the things he's proudest of is the World War II memorial. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Probably wouldn't have happened. Yeah, it wouldn't have happened without Bob. And um, his constant reiteration of the fact that the empirical evidence that the, that generation was dying off and we had to do something about it. And uh, Bob uh, put his heart and soul and shoulder to the wheel to uh, get that done. And, boy, his speech at that dedication was one of the great speeches. Uh, it, it reminded me of Reagan at Normandy. Bob had eloquent. I wrote it. Huh?